session with my dear friends and colleagues, Professor Mohammed Fahmi Abdul Aziz from Ayan Shams University, Professor Hala Ali Gamal Din from Cairo University, and Professor Ahmed Hassanin, ophthalmologist from Cairo University, Professor of Ophthalmology, Alhamdulillah Salam Amna Warna. I have the pleasure to present the first speaker, uh, Professor Shehnaz Karadaniz. She is a professor in endocrinology. She works at the Istanbul Florence Night. Yes, in Nightingale Hospital, and also teaches at the ophthalmology department of the Medical Faculty Istanbul, Science of University. She is founding member and member of the Board of Trustees of the Turkish Diabetes Foundation. She is also a council member of the ESD, European Association for the Study of Diabetes, for the term 2014 to 2017. She is also serves as the chair of the IDF Federation European Region Welcome to Egypt, to Professor Shehnaz, and please, she is going to talk about, about diabetic and uh, 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 retinopathy and overview. Please start, Professor Shehnaz. Thank you. First of all, first of all, I want to thank for the nice introduction, and also I want to thank to Professor El Sayed. Professor Hadidi and the organizing committee for inviting me and giving me the opportunity addressing you. Diabetic retinopathy is the most common and specific yes? uh, microvascular complication of diabetes. Decades ago, it is proposed that diabetic retinopathy signs may reflect generalized microangiopathic processes that affect not only the eyes, but also organs elsewhere in the body. During the years, studies have more precisely quantified the association of diabetic retinopathy with a diverse range of systemic vascular complications. <coughs> Clinical findings of diabetic retinopathy can range from minimal non-proliferative to advanced stages of proliferative retinopathy according to the extent and severity of the retinal hypoxia and increased vascular permeability. In non-proliferative retinopathy, the changes are within the confines of the retina. Proliferative retinopathy occurs with further retinal ischemia and is characterized by the growth of the new vascularization on the surface into the vitreous cavity in the back of the eye. These abnormal vessels may bleed, resulting in intraocular hemorrhage, traction, subsequent fibrosis, and tractional retinal detachment, as you saw in the left side of the last line, the, the, of the, 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 of the uh, photos on the uh, below. Diabetic maculopathy in the form of macular ischemia or edema at the central retina may be present at any stage of diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema is the most prevalent cause of visual impairment generally in people with diabetes. Although the most striking features of retinopathy are the vascular abnormalities, there is also growing evidence to define retinopathy as a form of chronic neovascular degeneration. Every patient with diabetes is at risk for developing retinopathy. In a population-based study, the overall 10-year incidence of retinopathy was 74%. Data from the 25-year follow-up of the younger onset group show that almost all patients developed retinopathy over time and with a third to a half developing sight threatening disease. Oh, I'm sorry for this. A projection for the numbers of people with diabetes aged 40 years or older 
and with retinopathy. It was done in US for the years 2005 and 2050. The forecast suggests that the number of people with retinopathy and vision threatening disease will almost triple in 2050. The projections indicate an even larger growth in these numbers among those 65 years or older. Regular screening is very important as the patient may have no complaints till late stages. The top two fundus photographs belong to the same patient who had diabetic macular edema and no visual problems uh, at his visit to our clinic in 2007 and came back two years later with center involvement and a vision of 10 to 20. And the photograph below left belongs to another patient with proliferative retinopathy and no visual complaints because no severe macular disease or intraocular hemorrhage from the neovascularizations. Opposed to another patient, again with proliferative retinopathy but severe visual loss due to intraocular hemorrhage as in the below right from this picture. The importance of screening is emphasized also by numerous specific guidelines published by professional societies. But unfortunately, compliance with recommended care is rather low for multiple reasons. In a teleophthalmology screening project in urban communities in Canada, they reached a considerable number of patients who reported never having had any ophthalmologic examination. In a population-based study again carried out in Canada, only 49% of patients with mean duration of diabetes uh, 9.6 years had their last eye examination within the last year, and about 10% did not have any eye examination before. I'm so sorry, I don't know how this happened, but on my computer these were all okay. The numbers are jumping right and left. In patients lastly examined, at least two years ago, neglicans was the main factor, although all were aware that diabetes may threat the vision. And interestingly, 47% acquainted with a person having a visual handicap. These results indicate two barriers which we have to deal with other than organizational kind, like difficult access to resources for successful screening programs. Yep, the numbers are... Yeah, yeah, they are also... No, probably this is something with, I mean, I mean non company yeah, yeah, maybe, because... No, no, it's not, I mean, it's going right and left not on the same order but this way okay. anyway yeah <laughs> no problem but i'm sorry for this i'm very I, I apologize i want to bring the recommended timetable for ophthalmological evaluation to your attention and patients with type 1 diabetes should have an initial dilated and comprehensive eye examination within five years after the onset of diabetes at the start of puberty or at age 10 years and after, whichever is earlier. Patients with type 2 diabetes, who generally have had years of undiagnosed diabetes, and therefore who have a significant risk of retinopathy at time of um, diagnosis, uh, should have initial dilated and comprehensive eye examination soon after the diagnosis. Subsequent fundus examinations for type 1 and type 2 diabetic, uh, diabetes are generally report, uh, repeated annually. If there is no evidence of retinopathy for one or more years, then exams every two years may be considered. In practice, timing and frequency of follow-up eye examinations are often individualized by also taking care of individual local or systemic factors 
affecting the progression. Women with pre-existing di uh, diabetes who are planning a pregnancy or who have already uh, become pregnant should have a comprehensive eye examination latest in the first trimester which close, uh, with close follow-up throughout the pregnancy and one year uh, postpartum. Tremendous advances in medical technology, medicines, and medical devices are occurring in the last several decades. In the 1990s, randomized controlled trials confirmed that control of hyperglycemia and hypertension could delay the onset or progression of uh, diabetic retinopathy. These findings, findings accelerated a movement uh, towards intensified risk factor control. One of the few longitudinal studies which was carried out in DCCT cohort and a subset of the Pittsburgh Epidemiology of Diabetes Complications Study aimed to analyze the clinical course of the cumulative incidence of long-term complications in the age of intensive therapy. It showed that the cumulative incidence of proliferative retinopathy was 21% in the DCCT intensive treatment group uh, versus nearly 50% in the other two groups. And an important question is whether these wonderful research outcomes in closely followed up and highly motivated patients are translated into the real lives of people with diabetes. Unfortunately, this is much beyond the desire. Brown and colleagues assess the contemporary threat from retinopathy. In other words, the extent to which modern intensified medical practices have slowed the progression of diabetic retinal disease in people with type 2 diabetes. They compared results from the Wisconsin Epidemiologic Study of Diabetic Retinopathy, which was carried out in the beginning of 1980s before aggressive risk factor control was widespread to contemporary data from a population that had an extended history of improved glucose and blood pressure control. The figures um, for background diabetic retinopathy and proliferative retinopathy are shown against duration-specific prevalence. In Wisconsin epidemiologic study, the figures are given separately, both for insulin-using and non-insulin-using people with type 2 diabetes. In the KPNV study, duration-specific prevalence of background retinopathy is much less than, than in either Wisconsin study, uh, in either Wisconsin uh, diabetic retinopathy cohort. This decrease is partly attributable to earlier diagnosis of diabetes in KPNV uh, cohort. But still, 11% of people with duration of diabetes five years and 23% of people with duration of diabetes nine years develop background retinopathy. For proliferative retinopathy, duration-specific prevalence in KPNV study approximates the prevalences for non insulin using Wisconsin epidemiology study group. Anyway, more population-based study is needed to uh, uh, replicate and explain this unexpected finding. Klein and colleagues have also looked into the relationship of period of diagnosis to the prevalence of visual impairment in people with type 1 diabetes. Visual impairment was defined as best corrected visual acuity in the better eye of 20 to 40 or worse. The study population was 4 to 80 years uh, of age at baseline. And for most duration of diabetes groups, the prevalence of visual impairment was lower in those diagnosed more recently than those diagnosed earlier. But still, diabetic retinopathy remains a leading cause of preventable blindness in the working age population. Again, in these nearly last four decades, laser photocoagulation has been the effective approach in the treatment of proliferative 
retinopathy and also of the diabetic macular edema with central involvement. The strongest evidence came from two randomized controlled trials in the 1970s and 1980s. In 2012, FDA approved an anti-VGF, ranibizumab, for the treatment of diabetic macular edema, the first approved treatment in nearly 30 years. Another anti-VGF, afilabercept, for intraocular use in retinopathy and diabetic macular edema, has also been approved by FDA, and other molecules are also on the way. It took about six decades from a possible angiogenic factor, the factor X, produced by the retina, to have a drug for intraocular use targeting the vascular endothelial growth factor, a possible candidate for this retinal factor X. Although therapies targeting the VGF are considered as a revolution in the treatment of diabetic um, retinopathy and macular edema, there are a number of limitations which needs to be addressed in the future, mainly the need for repeat intraocular injections and the potential for disease rebound after discontinued the treatment. A Cochrane review about anti-VGF treatment of diabetic macular edema was published in October